Hello and welcome to Clinical Cases Part 1 for the Musculoskeletal Blog. Today we're going to be taking a look at some of the common abnormalities within the musculoskeletal system, including green stick fractures, primary and secondary bone healing and fractures, gout and pseudogout, rheumatoid arthritis, SLE, systemic sclerosis, polymyositis and dermatomyositis. So let's start with green stick fractures. So, a green stick fracture is a fracture of a bone occurring typically in children, and this is where one side of the bone is broken and the other side is bent, and this is as a result of the type of bone that is present in children. So, in children, the bone is porous, and therefore they're more bendy. There's a thick periosteum, which means there's improved blood supply, and this makes them less likely to break and makes them stronger. So, essentially, children have got these bones that are more likely to bend than break, and they're softer and more flexible. So these most commonly occur in children when they fall and they put their arms and hands out to stop them falling. So the signs and symptoms of a green stick fracture are pain in the affected area. Older children will be more protective of the area and younger children or babies will start to cry uncontrollably. And swelling, redness and bruising may also occur up to hours after the injury. Now with regards to just generally looking at a fracture, a fracture is the cracking or breaking of a hard material such as bone. So a fracture can occur in two ways. It's either when we have abnormal forces applied to normal bone or normal forces applied to abnormal bone. And there are a few remodeling laws which you should be aware of in terms of the fixing of the fracture. So Wolf's law states that bone remodels in line with the stresses that's exerted upon the bone. And the hutter volkmann law is remodeling occurs in result of traction and compressive stress. So this, for example, is some of the things that we can do surgically um, to help mend the fracture. So different types of fractures, the, they can be displaced, they can be non-displaced, they can be open or closed. So in a displaced fracture, the bone snaps in two or more parts and moves so that the two ends are not lined up straight, whereas in a non-displaced fracture, the bone cracks but it maintains its proper alignment. So here the bone has maintained its alignment, albeit it has bent on one side, but the bone has maintained its alignment so there's a non-displacement here. Next we can talk about primary and secondary bone healing. Now, in a normal fracture, we think about secondary bone healing, where we think about intramembranous and endochondral bone formation. But it's important to be aware of primary bone healing as well. So primary bone healing occurs normally where we have remodeling instead of healing due to having such a small fracture or surgical repair to make the body believe that it's not actually broken. So we don't need to form any soft or hard callus here. So the primary healing occurs even if there's a minimal gap, and this is called gap healing, and the bone is continually modelled by cutter cones, and cutter cones tunnel through the compact bone and create new haversian osteans. But what's really important is secondary bone healing. So this is where we have relative stability, and what we need to do is form a callus. So this happens in a several stage process. So we have, first of all, a hematoma. So this is where blood forms between the fragment ends that have broken. During the first few days, that hematoma changes to granulation tissue, which is a bit stiffer, and then neutrophils flood to this site to clean up and release interleukin-6. And interleukin-6 really recruits fibroblasts and macrophages as well. So there are two types of macrophages. You have local macrophages, also called osteomax, and these call, cause intramembranous bone formation. And then we have external macrophages from elsewhere, and these cause endochondral bone formation. Essentially what we're forming is a soft callus which eventually will develop into a hard callus and we do this by laying down collagen type 3 which eventually will become collagen type 1 and this hard bony callus bridges the fracture between the two broken fragments. So in terms of management, the treatments needed so that the bone unites in an acceptable position. In other words, we need to reunite the bone so that there's just as much mobility and a performance as there was before the break. So in terms of non-operative treatments, we can look at reductions, casts and splints. And then in terms of surgical options, we can look at intramedullary nailing and bridge plating. But really, we're trying to fix the bone in place so that it heals correctly in an acceptable position. So poor healing fractures, really these are fractures um, where the bones have poor vasculature, so there's poor blood supply. So some examples include the fifth metatarsal base, the humerus head, the navicular bone, the head of the femur, um, and the talus. So if we just quickly zoom in on two of those, so the head of the humerus, um, so there's a poor blood supply here, and this is exactly the same at the hip. And as a result, we've got a poor blood supply, and usually older people do tend to have a full hip replacement if they fracture here, um, if it's a bad fracture. 
because actually the vasculature is so poor it takes such a long time to recover. With a scaphoid fracture, so one of the smaller bones of the wrist and hand, there's a poor blood supply here as well and it heals slowly. So a long-term complication here is arthritis. So it's important that we kind of manage these in an appropriate way with the understanding that the vasculature is poor. So we can promote bone healing in a variety of ways through diet and nutritional supplements. We can stop smoking, which also aids bone healing. There's adequate blood glucose control in diabetes. And once healing has occurred, physical therapy usually aids rehabilitation as well. Now, as well as promoting bone healing, we also need to prevent hindering bone healing. So we need to prevent movement of the bone fragments. We need to prevent weight bearing too soon, albeit weight bearing and physical therapy is good, but only at the correct time when advised. So the healing process generally takes 6 to 12 weeks for a normal fracture, and children's bones heal more quickly than adults. And it's important to immobilise the bone at first, and then weight bear, and then physical therapy. So it's important to do those in the correct order. And this diagram here shows what happens as described when we looked at the previous slide about the hematoma formation and how this gradually becomes a bony callus to bridge the gap between the two bones, between the bone ends that are fractured. So a colleague's fracture, just to be aware, is a fracture at the distal end of the radius. It's quite a um, common fracture and that's why it's important to be aware of it. It's the opposite of a Smith's fracture, so do look those up if you're curious about them. Next we have gout and pseudogout. So gout is a form of inflammatory arthritis characterised by recurrent attacks of red, tender, hot and swollen joints. So the pain typically comes on rapidly in less than 12 hours. So we'll look at arthritis in a few moments. But gout, first of all, is a acute attack, essentially, of red, tender, hot and swollen joints. So it's the most common inflammatory arthropathy we see in primary care, and it's much more common in men than it is in women. And it's very rare, particularly in premenopausal women. So this results as a result of elevated serum urate levels, which cause the body tissues to become super saturated, and monosodium urate crystals form in and around the joint. As a result, we get white cell response and inflammation, which causes this redness, this tenderness and this hotness of the joint. So the clinical features of day-to-day -day gout include hyperuricemia. So this, however, is normally asymptomatic. But the first presentation of gout is normally as a result of an acute attack, where you get this rapid onset of a hot and exquisitely tender swollen joints. It often develops overnight, and it's usually in the metacarpopharyngeal joints in about 89% of gout patients. Be aware of what hyperuricemia is and be aware that the risk factors for this include lifestyle, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, renal disease, diuretics and aspirin, as well as a family history. The, clinic, the key clinical difference between gout and pseudogout is that gout is caused by monosodium urate monohydrate crystals and it produces a negative test and pseudogout is caused by calcium pyrophosphate crystals and this produces a positive biofringent test. Next we can look at rheumatoid arthritis. So this is a long-term autoimmune disorder that primarily affects the joints, resulting in warm, swollen and painful joints. It's much more common, three times more common in females than it is in males. And currently, however, this reducing incidence in women and the peak of age of onset is increasing. So older people are starting to get this disease more commonly. It's got linked it's got links to increased mortality with regards to cardiovascular disease and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma as well. So the risk factors for rheumatoid arthritis are genetic aspects, so concordance as shown in twins, is also association with HLA class 2 antigens, and there's also a gene which shows some susceptibility to rheumatoid arthritis. Environmental factors are also thought to play a role, so pregnancy, sex hormones, obesity, diet high in coffee and red meat, and cigarette smoking are believed to all increase the risk of getting rheumatoid arthritis. Things to point out here, the key clinical difference between rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis will be covered in a later video and is essentially an increase in synovial fluid and loss of joint space, so damage to articular cartilage and bone on bone rubbing against each other. This is different from rheumatoid arthritis, so rheumatoid arthritis, as you can see in this picture here in the bottom, is swelling and inflammation of the synovial membrane, leading to erosion of the bones around the joint and healthy cartilage remains. So it's all about inflammation of the synovial membrane in rheumatoid arthritis. So next we have SLE, or systemic lupus erythematous. So this is an autoimmune condition um, of a connective tissue similar to systemic sclerosis, which we'll talk about next, uh, it's also similar to rheumatoid arthritis and mixed connective tissue disease, in the respect that they're all autoimmune mediated. So often the symptoms of the diseases do overlap, and in cases where it's impossible to distinguish between them, we can just say that the patient is suffering a mixed connective tissue disease. 
So the epidemiology of SLE it occurs in 1 in 1,000 white females, and the female to male ratio is 2 to 1 in childhood and menopause, but 8 to 1 in childbearing years. So it's much more common as well in black people and Hispanics. And the symptoms that the patients will present with include fever, joint pain, a photosensitive rash, so a malar rash or a butterfly rash, and mucosa damage as well, so mouth with nose ulcers. So it's important to be aware of a bit of a pathophysiology behind SLE. So it's um, an autoimmune mediated disease with no clear cause, but it's believed to be a mix of genetics and environmental factors that stimulate its development. So environmental factors include things like UV light, smoking, estrogen and viruses. And cells essentially undergo apoptosis and produce these apoptotic bodies and nuclear antigens. This is fairly normal in the body. But immune cells of SLE patients are more likely to see these um, apoptotic bodies as foreign intruders. And therefore they attack the nuclear antigens. And B cells will also produce nuclear, uh, anti-nuclear antibodies. So these anti-nuclear antibodies bind to the nuclear antigens to form antigen-antibody complexes. The complexes then enter the blood, travel to nearby vessels or organs and stick to the walls of them, and then as a result we have a local inflammatory response against these antigen-antibody complexes, leading to a type 3 hypersensitivity reaction. So it's actually a long kind of process which eventually leads to that lo local inflammation, which is the systemic lupus erythematose. Next we have systemic sclerosis. So systemic sclerosis is an autoimmune connective tissue disorder as well. And the main features here are collagen deposition, vascular alterations and immunolog immunological abnormalities. So the pathogenesis for systemic sclerosis is pretty unclear, but there are hypotheses as to how it works. There are two main types. So you could have limited cutaneous scleroderma. So this is scleroderma. In this variation, the signs are mostly confined to the hands, arm and face. And in 80% of patients, there's also pulmonary hypertension. In diffuse cutaneous scleroderma, in other words, systemic sclerosis, this overall disease, this is much more rapidly progressing than severe. It affects larger areas of the skin and there's multi-system involvement and it can be life-threatening. So, for example, if the heart, lungs, liver or kidneys become involved heavily, then it can lead to life-threatening complications. It's often associated with crest, which may describe the main signs and symptoms of systemic sclerosis. So we've got calcinosis, and this is where you have calcium deposits, which you can usually see in the fingers. There's also Raynaud's phenomenon, which you may have come across. So this is vasoconstriction, vasoconstriction or vasospasm of the extremities, particularly in cold um, weather. So esophageal dysmotility, so be aware of the American versus English spelling there, and this can lead to dysphagia in these patients. Uh, sclerodactyly, this is localised thickening and tightening of the skin. And then we've got telangiectasia, so these are red spots on the skin due to widened venules. So the pathophysiology, as we've said, it's fairly unknown, but for a, a suspected uh, hypothesis, um, usually it's an etiological agent, so virus, chemical, some form of HLA um, or phenotypic change, which causes this to happen. And several cells are altered, fibroblasts, the endothelium and immune cells, leading to the symptoms. So altered fibroblasts cause excess collagen in the skin and organs. Altered endothelium cells cause changes in the arteries and the arterioles, and then immune cell alteration leads to increase of cytokines and abnormal production of antibodies. Lastly for this video we'll take a look at polymyositis and dermatomyositis. So these are also connective tissue disorders characterised by inflammation of the muscles. So they belong to a group of conditions called idiopathic inflammatory myopathies. These are chronic autoimmune conditions which affect primarily the proximal muscles. So this is a key similarity between polymyositis and dermatomyositis, that they both work proximally to distally. They're both also more common in women, and they both will have elevated serum creatinine kinase levels. But most importantly, they both have an autoimmune basis. With regards to the epidemiology of polymyositis and dermatomyositis, polymyositis tends to present between the ages of 30 and 60 with a smaller peak at the age of 15, and dermatomyositis can affect anyone at any age, but both are more, twice as more common in women as they are in men. So really we see muscle weakness, aching and painful muscles, extreme tiredness and general malaise, and it's important to manage this and not just leave it because the muscle weakness will progressively get worse. And therefore, we should look at treating, for example, polymyositis with high-dose corticosteroids. So that's everything for this video. I hope you found it useful. If you do have any feedback, please do let me know. Um, and thank you for listening.